Dale's present, all counsel's present, the jury is not. Uh, a couple of things, let me just bring to y'all's attention. After the uh, uh, recommendation has been published, I intend to, uh, uh, if requested, I'll ask the state first and the defense to poll them under 7.12. Uh, here's the language on it if y'all want to look, but it's, well, I'll read it. It, it reads, Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we're going to ask each of you individually concerning the advisory sentence. It's not necessary that you state how you personally voted or how any other person voted, but only if the advisory sentence as read was correctly stated. And then I would ask, do you, Mr. or Ms., agree and confirm that a majority of the jury join in the advisory sentence that you just heard read from the clerk? Or do you agree and confirm that at least six or more of the jury join the advisory since you have just heard or read by the clerk, depending on the recommendation? The state have any objections to that? If, no, sir. So, I, if, this is if either side requests poll. No objection. Okay. And, and when it's published, I'll ask the state first in the defense. Okay. Uh, also, um, I, I got a final copy for of the instruction for the state and defense. I've also had 12 copies made for each individual juror. I've directed the uh, deputy when they retire to deliberate, they'll be passed out a copy of the instructions. Uh, also, just so you all know, they've been given menus and their food is being ordered for them uh, once we get that far. Ready to have him come in? Yes, sir. Defense ready to have him come in? Judge, just one thing. When the state finishes with their closing argument, I'd ask for a little bit of a break because we have to bring it. Yeah, they told me. I'll, I'll let y'all bring it in, Senator. They, they told me. Okay, if y'all want any time warning, if you let uh, Ms. Leslie or Ms. Dever know, they're happy to warn you. Um, and while the lawyers are addressing the jury, please, if y'all wouldn't mind, turn off your cell phones and being quiet so that uh, the jury can pay attention and not be distracted. I would appreciate it very much. Mr. Riles, if you'd bring him in, please. And just, of course, after y'all are finished and, they, and after I've instructed him, I'll excuse the three alternates. Okay. And if y'all are right, I'll just advise him the evidentiary portion of the penalty phase is concluded. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you all very much for bearing with us and your attention. <laughs> Members of the jury, the evidentiary portion of the penalty phase is concluded. The attorneys now will present their final arguments. Please remember that what the attorneys say is not evidence. However, do listen closely to their arguments. They are intended to aid you in understanding the case. Each side will have equal time, uh, but under the rules of procedure, the state is entitled to address you first, followed by the defense. So if you'll give Mr. Bacadal your attention, please.
Good morning. Good morning. So you know, I it doesn't really matter how many times you do this because, of course, every case is different. Um, but you find yourself, or I find myself, lying awake in the early morning hours, staring at the ceiling, wondering what do I say to these folks? You know, do they have questions about what an aggravator is, or how an aggravator works, or how you might weigh a mitigator? And, you know, inevitably, I'm not going to be able to answer all your questions, and we talked about that a little bit during jury selection. But, you know, one of the things that constantly goes through your mind is, what do you tell them about the victim? Because at the end of the day, and it's inevitable in any kind of a murder case, whether it's a death penalty case or not, that lost in this process, lost in the evidence, and lost in the procedures, is what we're really talking about and it's human life. And so I want to talk just for a minute about Garrett. You know, some of us are blessed to know from a very early age what we want to do. Most of us, though, bump around through our teenage years into our late teens before we kind of find ourselves, find our groove. But Gary very early on had an idea. Now, what four-year-old kid doesn't want to be a cop, particularly a boy? I mean, it's just natural. That's kind of what, you know, you see on TV. But Gary came from a family where his father was a law enforcement officer. And so that kind of, you know, was it the badge? Was it the neat, shiny uniform and the, you know, the gun? What was it about it? But it exposed him to that lifestyle. And so from a very early age, what he wanted to be was a cop. And don't think, there's nothing wrong, you know, cop is a constable on patrol. So that's not a derogatory term. And he carried through with his dream because at the early age of 17, he committed himself, joined the United States Air Force, and got into their MP program to run a dog and got law enforcement experience and became immersed in the culture. And then when he left, he joined the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office to pursue a noble profession, an honorable profession. Now we know, because we've talked about it, that there are good and bad in all. But the evidence that you heard in this case suggested only good of this man, a hero. We use that term perhaps too frequently as well. You know, somebody who rescues a cat out of a tree is a hero. Well, no, that's not it. You know, you don't necessarily have to do something great in your life to be a hero. You can be a hero if you commit yourself to a cause. And Gary Morales committed himself to the public safety. And that's what he dedicated his life and his profession to. Gary Morales was a son. He was a brother. He was a friend. He was a husband and a dad. Gary Morales was human. But now Gary's dead. And he's dead because one person made choices. One person, out of his own selfish desires, elected to make choices. In life, we all make choices. Sometimes we make choices completely well-intentioned, and bad things happen, and we must then suffer the consequences. We roll through a red light, we have an accident, maybe we get sued. You know the story, we talked about it. But sometimes you make choices that you know are bad, and you know the consequences of them are going to be forever, and then you must be held accountable. So let's look as we probe that law in this case, because again, it all comes back to the law. It's the only thing that matters here. Our personal feelings, our bias, our prejudice, our emotions do not hold sway in a court. What matters is the law. The judge is going to read you an instruction to this effect. It is your duty to follow the law that I will now give you, and that you are to render to the court an advisory sentence based upon the determination of, as to whether or not there are sufficient aggravating circumstances which exist to justify the imposition of the death penalty, and whether sufficient mitigating circumstances exist to outweigh any aggravating circumstances found to exist. So I first want to talk about, like, what, what is... You know, when you came in here, old 
six weeks ago, you had no idea what an aggravating circumstance or a mitigating circumstance was. We instructed you on it a little bit, but you haven't given a lot of thought to it, but let's kind of break it down as to how this works. You see, you've already determined his legal culpability in the murder of Gary Rouse. You have said unequivocally and clearly that he is guilty of first-degree murder of a law enforcement officer and aggravated assault of a law enforcement officer and fleeing and eluding and possession by a convicted felon. Those matters are off the table. So now it becomes a question of, so what next? What's the appropriate punishment? And it's now a question of moral culpability. So you must now concern yourself with his moral culpability in recommending a fair and just sentence to the judge. This is a decision in the end that each one of you will make individually. So, what is an aggravating circumstance? <clears throat> this is the instruction. An aggravating circumstance is a standard or a guide, if you will, to the jury in making the choice between the alternatives of life in prison without parole and death. But in the end, and there are very, they're specifically enumerated, and we're going to talk about them, but in the end, what an aggravated circumstance means is it increases the gravity of a crime or the harm to a victim. It's something about how the crime was committed or against whom the crime was committed that makes it different. Because in the end, the death penalty is reserved for the most aggravated and the least mitigated first degree murders. So, the first aggravator the judge will instruct you on is that the defendant was previously convicted of a felony involving the threat of violence to a person. And that, in this case, is the crime of aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer. This is a felony involving the use of threat of violence to another person. Now, I must prove each of my aggravators to you, just like in the guilt phase, beyond and to the exclusion of a reasonable doubt. You have found the presence of this aggravator. So now what you have to do is you have to think to yourselves, okay, what does it mean? What does it mean? How does it increase the gravity of the crime? And so let me suggest this to you, that in the process of committing first degree murder, that is in shooting a, for all intents and purposes, defenseless law enforcement officer as he sat behind the wheel of his car. Fleeing from that, another officer arrives on scene and he points the gun at him. How does that aggravate first degree murder? Well, here's how it aggravates it. You see, what Clarence Bennett saw February 28, 2013 is something, of course, he'll never forget. It's inexplicable or indescribable, I think, as he indicated. But not only did he witness, I witness, the cold, mur cold and calculated murder of his sergeant, but then he had to process what he was seeing and take action. And as he stepped out of the car, what he told you is the defendant pointed the gun at him. And at that point in time, he himself thought, and completely justifiably so, given what he had just seen, that he's next, that his life was in danger. That is an aggravating factor. Now you may say to yourself, if that's it, I weigh that, I think it's weighty, but in light of whatever mitigation you might find, it doesn't outweigh the mitigation. That's how you're gonna do this process. But this is the first one, and each of you individually may find this to be more or less weighty than any of the other aggravators that we're gonna discuss. So let's move on. There's a concept at law called doubling, okay? The judge will talk to you about this, and the instruction basically reads, the state can't rely upon a single aspect of the offense to establish more than one aggravating circumstance. Therefore, if you find that two or more of the aggravating circumstances are proven beyond a reasonable doubt by a single aspect of the offense, and just, you're gonna get all these instructions in, in packet form again, uh, by a single aspect of the offense, you are to consider that as supporting only one aggravator. So the next three aggravators that I'm going to talk about are really going, you must consider them as one and then weigh it accordingly. So let's look at the first one. The victim of the capital felony was a law enforcement officer engaged in the performance of his official duties. So, what do we know? We know that in your verdict, you found the defendant guilty as charged of murdering a law enforcement officer engaged in his official duties. You have found that aggravator beyond and to the exclusion of a reasonable doubt. Now here's what you say to yourself. What does that mean? How does that aggravate this crime? Well, let me ask you this. 
There isn't an aggravator at law that says, if the victim of the capital felony was a teacher engaged in the performance of her duties, or a truck driver, or a UPS employee, or a gardener. Okay? The law specifically recognizes that the murder of a law enforcement officer is something so much different. Why? Why is that? Here's the deal. Today, I got up and brushed my teeth and drank my coffee and took a look at the paper and walked out the front door. Wife, daughter sleeping soundly in bed. I'll see them tonight. I know I will. It's not something I even think about. But you see, the men and women who wear the uniform and the badge, it's different for them when they walk out the front door each and every day. It's not our job, our kind of job. It's understood that on any given day, fortuity, a wrong turn. I want you to think, if Gary had, let's say we don't know exactly where he was coming from, but if he had been coming down US-1 and turned on to Glenview when he saw the defendant, what if he had been 10 seconds later that morning leaving the house? and not encountered the defendant's car and whatever it is that he observed the defendant doing that caused him to conduct the traffic stop. Gary would be alive. But you see, they know that each day, when they pull someone over or they encounter a citizen, we all know they're armed. But they don't know if we're armed. And on this day, on February 28th, when Gary left his house, when Gary left his family, he knew that this could be the last day, and it was for him. But he took that job on. Nobody made Gary be a law enforcement officer. It's what Gary wanted. But in the end, we recognize as a society that given the sacrifices they make for our safety, if somebody intentionally with premeditation murders them in the course of their duties, that is an aggravator. And let me say to you, if you think of weight, what could be more weighty than a this aggravator? This aggravator in exchange for what they provide us. It's your job to decide that. But I want you to think about it from the perspective of from, from why. Well, how does this increase the gravity of the crime? It increases it because of who he murdered. The third. The capital felony was committed to disrupt or hinder the lawful exercise of any government function or the enforcement of the laws. We live in a nation which is defined by laws. It is a government of laws and not of men. And you see, if we take it upon ourselves to disregard the rules that we all follow, it's chaos. You know what? So all of a sudden your money isn't worth anything. All of a sudden you don't have any property rights. All of a sudden it's chaos. And so people are in place in our lives that enforce the laws. We may not like it. Some of us have had a few speeding tickets. Some of us have been pulled over by the cops. And you don't like it. Nobody likes it. But it's done for a purpose, to maintain order. We didn't have speed limits, or we didn't have stop signs or rules regarding running through red lights. We would all be in grave danger. And so the law recognizes that if an individual murders somebody, to avoid the enforcement of the laws, that's aggravating. And that is aggravating because it strikes at the very foundation of who we are as a civilized society. He clearly murdered Gary Morales to avoid enforcement of the laws. And then finally, it was committed for the purpose of avoiding arrest or effecting an escape from custody. So. We also, as a nation, believe in a concept of personal responsibility. I talked to you about this at the very beginning. That we engage in activities in our lives for which we must take responsibility. Sometimes we have good results, sometimes we have bad results. But in the end, we're responsible for the choices we exercise using our own free will, assuming we have the capacity to do so. And that means if you break the laws, you know where that matter is settled? Not as the deputy sits behind the wheel of his patrol car being pumped full of bullets. It's settled right here. Right here, what we're doing. Right with this witness stand, where that deputy takes a stand in the presence of you folks 
takes an oath and tells you what happened. And then you decide, was the law broken? But you can't avoid that process, that process which is the foundation of our criminal justice system, by murdering an officer to avoid detection. So these three aggravators that are one are, you know, if it isn't enough for you, then it isn't enough. It's ultimately your decision. But these aggravators go to basically civil society. They can, there can be no more weighty aggravators, I would suggest to you. And these aggravators scream out for the imposition of the death penalty. So, if you agree with me, then the next step you must engage in is consider the mitigation. Consider what they put on. There are a couple of things. First of all, the burden that they prove it by is less. The judge will give you that instruction. Now, they may say to you something that argue it as mitigating. It's your job to decide if it's mitigating. For instance, they may tell you, that this doesn't apply, so I use it as an example, the defendant wet his bed until he was 13. It would be your job to decide, is that mitigating? And if it's mitigating, then you would decide how much weight to give it. If you don't consider it mitigating, you don't have to consider it and weigh it against this incredible weight of aggravation. So, what does mitigation mean? Mitigating factors. Again, the judge will give you all this on paper. It is a circumstance not limited to the facts surrounding the crime. It can be anything in the life of the defendant, which I might indicate that the death penalty is not appropriate for the defendant. In other words, a mitigating circumstance may include any aspect of the defendant's character, background, or life, or any circumstance of the offense that may reasonably indicate that death penalty is not an appropriate sentence. What mitigation comes down to is this. It's this concept of moral culpability. Is there something about the defendant, his background, anything that you can imagine that would make the death penalty inappropriate? And that's what I'm here to talk to you about now. I don't know, just like I didn't know what the defense was, I don't know what the mitigation is. I can only surmise based upon the testimony we all sat through over the last several days. And so I'm going to go through some of those with you. The first one is, there's a specific instruction that the judge will read that says the age of the defendant at the time of the crime can be considered mitigated. Well, let's talk about that. What do you think that's for? What do you think, who do you think the, that is designed for? A 25-year-old man, right, at the time of the murder? Or is it a design for an 18 or a 19 or a 20-year-old kid with very little life experiences, perhaps of low intelligence, perhaps of a very bad background, somebody who really hasn't had the opportunity to make well-reasoned decisions in his or her life. When we talk about age, so you can look at this and you can say, yeah, I think 25 is a mitigating age. That's up to you because it's ultimately your decision. But let me show you why it's not. See, because when you're 25, you're old enough to drive a car. Well, you're also old enough to drive a car when you're 16. So maybe that doesn't mean a lot. You're old enough to vote. Well, so what? You're old enough to vote when you're 18. You're old enough to buy alcohol, all right? You're old enough to serve in our military. The things that we allow you to do once you get past certain ages in this country recognize or a recognition by society that you can handle it, that you're up to it. There is nothing you can do in this country short of perhaps running for, I don't know, maybe... Uh, Congress or presidency or something that you can't do at 25 years of age. This is not mitigation. And there's no, in, there's no indication of immaturity or lack of development here that would make that more mitigating. You know what I mean? Objection, Your Honor. Any opposed? Yes. So when you look at his age, and you see that there's no indication of immaturity or lack of development, that tends to 
corroborate or bolster the fact that his age at 25 is not mitigating in nature. It doesn't d decrease his moral culpability is what we're talking about. He's educated and skilled. He was capable of holding a job. He has a height. This is not somebody who, due to, to learning difficulties, dropped out of school, very unskilled, living on the fringes of society. This is a guy who could communicate well. This is a guy who was educated, had an AA. This is somebody who had the ability to become a productive member of society. So his age is not mitigating. I would suggest that you shouldn't find this to be mitigating, or if you do, you should give it extremely little weight. The next is, does the existence of any other factors in the defendant's character, background, or life, or the circumstances of the offense that would mitigate against the imposition of the death penalty? This is kind of a repeat of the original instruction. This is just anything in the defendant's character, background, or life. So, what might they argue to you? That he has a family that cares about him. Yeah. He has a son that he can see in jail. He has a son that he can sing to. He has a son that he can talk to. He has a mother who comes to see him. And aunts and family members. People who care about him. So is that mitigating? I don't know. It's really up to you. But one thing I do know, and one thing I talked to you about, in the initial phase of this trial was what the law says about how you weigh evidence, how you deliberate, and the law says your recommendation must not be based upon the fact that you feel sorry for anyone or are angry at anyone. And just like that instruction applied in the first phase of the trial, it applies in this phase of the trial. So when you consider that fact of his family and so forth, I want you to consider this. You know what? They're victims too. Yes, of course they are. But do you know who made them a victim? Do you know whose fault it is? As we stand in this courtroom and we assign blame, it's nobody but his. And I want you to think about kind of the perversion of the argument, if you will, that for somehow the volitional, intentional acts he chose to engage in on February 28th that then caused pain to him, his family, should somehow now be mitigated. Sympathy doesn't have a place in this process as the judge will instruct you. Your recommendation should not be influenced by feelings of sympathy. You're weighing the facts. Now, it's your decision what weight to give them. But you shouldn't be making decisions out of sympathy because that's a two-way street. And that's why we don't do it. Your recommendation must be based on the evidence in the law. Well, you also have numerous pictures which depicted a full life. Pictures of him as a child, pictures of him with city commissioners, pictures, pictures, to see how his life progressed. And what you saw was very interesting. You saw somebody who had chances in life. Many chances. Opportunities. You think about the people in this world. Think about the people outside of this country. But then think of our own in this country and some of the deprivations, and the pain, and the struggles. He had opportunities that he squandered because of choices he made. Nobody forced the choice on him to get in that car February 28th knowing the drive, his license was suspended. He made that decision of his own, free will, and then would have to suffer the consequences, but to an attempt to avoid them. He's a good worker. Is that mitigating? That he can hold down a job? That he can keep a job? I mean, Mr. Reedy said he's a sharp kid. He could follow instructions. I had to tell him once he got it done. Is that mitigating? Maybe. But when you consider what weight to give it, think of this. It means he had the ability to work. Right? If we're not talking about somebody, again, let's say who's mildly mentally de defective or whatever the present term is, this is a guy who is educated, who can have a job. He could choose to work, which is significant, if he wanted to, because we know on occasions he had held down jobs. That means in the end, I mean, this is, the doors are, you know, we're going to talk about it in a moment, but opportunities 
avail, you avail yourselves of opportunities and sometimes you make opportunities. Nothing is free in this world. We don't give away things. You earn things. And he had the ability to do that. He had the intellect, he had the work ethic, but he chose not to. So does that make the fact that he's a good worker mitigating? What his aunt, to his aunt told you is he just couldn't get his foot in the door. But you know what? That's not true. That's not true. Because we know, um, again, the difficulties with work were the result of his free choices, but what we know from the lady from Circus Chemicals, and it sounded like a promising opportunity for him, but it's something he didn't want to do. He chose not to perform well in that job because it wasn't what he wanted to do. The, but the, that doesn't mean that he didn't have opportunities. It didn't mean that he couldn't go out and find work because he had the ability. If he didn't have the ability, we'd be talking about something totally different, wouldn't we? His mother used cocaine during his pregnancy. Now, we heard this from the sister, the last sister to testify. You should take it as a, a proven fact. But what does that mean? Now, we know that if somebody uses drugs, we, we, just, I don't, we don't even need expert testimony for this, we just know it. If you use drugs or you use alcohol and you got, you're pregnant, it's a potential that your kid could be harmed by that. And that should be something we could consider. But the problem is that's not what the facts show here. Because what I ask you is how did his mother's cocaine use affect his moral culpability? for events that were occurred 24 years, 25 years later, when he murdered Sergeant Morales. Well, number one, we don't, he didn't develop any learning disabilities as a result of it. I think his aunt said maybe he was a little uh, crying a little bit in the early formative days or months of his life. But in terms of his development from that point forward, completely normal, right? So it's not good. But when you weigh it, what does it really mean? He performed well in school. We know that he was at least average intelligence. Now, if you go to a gifted program, I don't. My, I, I assume gifted means you're more than average. And so he went to gifted programs. We know that he graduated from high school, and we also know that he got an AA degree. So to what extent did that impact him? And ultimately, impact what he did February 28th? How does it lessen his moral culpability for murdering a police officer? Man, he was raised without a father. And that's tough. And we know it. It's a factor you can consider. But you know what? There are thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of young little boys and girls outside the doors of this courthouse who are raised without a father, some without a mother, that never murder. That never, ever, ever murder. That in fact, grow up to be President of the United States on two occasions in this country. So, yeah, it stinks. It can be mitigating. But how much weight do you give that when oh, he's surrounded by a couple of male role models who could provide him with some guidance and more importantly the benefit of a supportive network, right? This is not some kid alone in some crack den with no adult supervision and no food and no medical care and no clothing or what the case might be. He had a whole family, a whole supportive family. So you can consider that to be mitigating if you believe it to be mitigating. And then you got to decide what weight to give it. So I would suggest to you that this is entitled to little to no weight. Now, he lost those two role models in a very short period of time. And that's traumatic. We know that. We don't need an expert to tell us about that. But let me ask you this. Who should know better? Who should know better the pain caused when a loved one's life is taken in a senseless act of violence? Someone who's never experienced that? or somebody who has. So when we talk about this, I want you to remember he felt whatever pain he felt when his uncle was murdered. He would know then would be pain others would feel as a result of his intentional acts. So is that mitigating? Maybe. 
How much weight do you give it, though? He lived in a neighborhood which had his I issues. There's no, okay, so there's some, with regards to that neighborhood down in Jupiter, Florida. All right, Jupiter, Florida. Not in Miami, not in Cooper City, not in Detroit, not in East L.A., but in Jupiter, Florida, where they had some drug dealing and a friend of his was murdered. <coughs> but this is not running what, what I think one of the, first of all, he had a home. They had a home. His mother worked and got a home and put a roof over his head. But it's not a war zone like Dr. Garbarino talked about. It's not that kind of living in that kind of environment that is so damaging. So, I, and again, I don't know if this is what they're arguing. I'm just trying to figure out based on what I heard with you. And don't forget, there's a lot of evidence about him being over at his aunt's or living at his aunt's for a period of time when there's no indication that there was any problem with that particular neighborhood. And again, I don't know the details or the dates or time frame, but there is that, that he's living with his aunt and his uncle and his extended loving, caring family. So it takes us to the expert testimony. And the issue here is, what did they tell us? And in light of what they told us, is it mitigating or not? Well, the rules that applied in the regular phase of the trial are the exact same rules here. That is weighing a witness's credibility. And the first one is, did the witness have some interest in how the case should be decided? I'm sure you got sick of me asking every, every witness, okay, what is your position regarding the death penalty? Because I also asked you, and you, and you, and all of you during jury selection. And why did we ask that? Because if you had a position on one extreme or the other, and you couldn't set that aside, and you couldn't follow the law, you weren't qualified to serve because you weren't objective. You weren't open to following the law, to listening to the evidence on the aggravators and the mitigators and rendering a recommendation to the court. If these guys get on the stand and they're openly opposed and in support of the abolition of the death penalty. Now, what, what's, so what's that mean? That means if you have a bias in favor of one thing or another, how you view the facts, you view through the prism of that bias. And ultimately, it affects what you believe the truth to be. See, here's the, this is the best part of the truth, is that it is immutable, meaning it does not change over time. The truth is not convenient. The truth just exists. And for these guys, for these two, Dr. Garbarino and Mr. McAndrews, both of whom are opposed to the death penalty, are not concerned with the truth, they're concerned with how they can portray or represent to you their experiences in the light that might provide mitigation. Garbarino even expressed an objection to the sentence of life without parole, up to potentially the age of 30, based upon his beliefs regarding developmental adversity and so forth, or develop, development. So these are really very strongly held beliefs, and you should be considering that when you're weighing their testimony back there. And what does Dr. Garbarino say? You remember I asked him about this. When you first met the defendant, how did you introduce yourself? Uh -huh. Hi. You know, I introduced him as, I'm part of the team. A team. That denotes being, you know, team players, team members work together to, for a common goal. That's not what experts do. And in fact, Dr. Cunningham told you just that, because I asked him. I said in your book, you talk about avoid becoming a member of the team because it ultimately impacts your objectivity. That's why I talked about these things. Did the witness receive any money? That, that's the, they're experts, they get paid. Take it for what it's worth. Now, the judge will tell you, just like he told you in the original part of the trial, the penalty, the guilt phase, expert witnesses are like all other witnesses, with one exception, the law permits the expert to give an opinion. However, an expert opinion is only reliable when given on a subject about which you believe the person to be an expert. Like all other witnesses, you may believe and I underline it, and when, that, when somebody does that, that means you're trying to emphasize it, or disbelieve all or any part of an expert's testimony. So you are free, based upon your own personal view of the evidence and what you know about the truth, to disregard the testimony of all or any of these experts. So let's talk about each one. 
What did Mr. McAndrew tell you? Mr. McAndrew is the former, worked his way up and was a prison warden or something to that effect. He told you the defendant can live in open population without being a harm to himself or to others. So, in his crystal ball, based upon his experience of working with inmates over the years, he's able to discern that the defendant is not going to be violent in prison. Well, first I say, so what? But ultimately, it's your job to decide whether or not, number one, it's mitigating, and if it is mitigating, is it really entitled to any weight? He murdered a law enforcement officer, and despite that fact, McAndrews never says, how do you feel about law enforcement? Because guess what? No matter what you do, for the rest of his life, he will be surrounded by law enforcement officers. I think, just using your common sense, it's kind of important to know what a guy thinks about authority and being told what to do. On the street, certainly 24 hours a day. And you saw, you get flavors of that in the jail referrals. Okay, he didn't kill anybody while he was awaiting trial. He's also, you must assume, was on his very, very best behavior because he knew we were watching. And yet, despite that, he's F this, F that, kicking doors, inter okay, take it for what it's worth, right? This is when he's on his best behavior. And how does this lessen his moral culpability? How does this lessen the fact that he took the life of a law enforcement officer on duty in his patrol car. Does it? It's up to you. And then Dr. Cunningham, for $29,000, and I just rounded that down because he was over 80 hours when he was sitting here and presumably where the bills are still racking up, but for $29,000, he came in here and he told you that in the restricted environment of the prison, the defendant's not likely to engage in violence. Okay? Well, isn't that kind of intuitive? And here's why. Because really all of his testimony comes down to this. When you're in prison, he said, and the food's not real great, the one thing you really want is that can of beans or that honey bun. And you don't get those things if you're acted up. And so it's not him, you see. It's nothing about him personally that makes him not likely to engage in danger. It's his own selfish desires to make sure that he can have at least a little bit of comfort. In other words, he's going to make good choices there because it benefits him. Not the kind of choices he made out here. And then I would suggest to you it's somewhat disingenuous, the good doctor's testimony, when he tells you that part of his objective analysis, he pulled out that match group, he called it, and it was six inmates out of 111 in Texas who had murdered a cop. And he compared that, their rate of violence, to what his circumstances, to try to tell you that he's not going to be a danger. But I told him, isn't, you know, there are a lot of cop killers out there. Can't you get to find a study that's got multiple cases? That, that's, that is disingenuous. And it suggests, just like I said to him, well, what if he had killed, what if it was just one guy and he killed somebody, would you come in here and tell them it's 100% likelihood he's going to kill? No. Statistics. But it's objective. He says his attitudes and feelings about law enforcement are irrelevant, just like Mr. McAndrews said. And again, I don't need to repeat my argument with that, but what about his handwritten notes? The point of these notes is to explain to you why the expert's opinion shouldn't be relied upon. Because what does he say? This is after he's murdered a law enforcement officer. And they're examining him, and they give him these notes that he's written and one of it is, I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees. Now, does that sound like somebody who's going to adjust real well to prison, that's going to like people telling them when to get up and when to go to bed? Or does that sound like somebody that could be dangerous? Or, what about this? A badge in America is a license to kill. What does he think of law enforcement? Doctor, how does he feel about authority? Doctor, how is he going to deal with officers, doctor? And I think I even asked the doctor, look, if you're interviewing a guy and he's got a PhD and no criminal history and a big supportive network and he's telling you during your interview, I'm going to kill every guard I ever see, 
what would that change your opinion about his future dangerousness? Well, this is something I'd have to, I think he said, you recall, you were there. I think this is something I would have to pass on for classification purposes. Okay, so, is he going to be a danger to others in prison? If you think he's not, I say to you, is it mitigating? Is it really mitigating? And if it, if it mitigates his moral culpability for the murder, the premeditated murder of a sworn law enforcement officer, by how much? How does the defendant's selfish motive to protect his privileges while incarcerated mitigate his moral culpability? And that's what I talked to you about initially. And then there's Dr. Garbarino. Now, ultimately, and I, 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 I apologize, as I, I just apologize, because I don't know. I'm not sure what his opinion is. But I believe it has something to do with the fact that the defendant, first of all, lives in America that is racist, is the victim of that racism in the su southern culture of honor. Let's say this. Nobody has said from the very beginning of this trial that there isn't racism in America. It's, you would be laughed out of the courthouse. It is a fact. But is it present in this case? Does it have any place in this courtroom? Did it affect what happened on February 28, 2013? Let me explain to you why they turned to racism and this southern culture of honor, which I guess if you bump into some of you, you got to punch them. That's the best I got out of it. Here's why we're talking about this. Because he says he approaches every case assuming he's going to find a severely damaged person. Right? Remember I said, you remember my colleague asked you, doctor, about... Um, would you take a case, case from the state? And he said, sure, but you're not going to like what I got to say. Now, does that sound like the objective state, an objective statement of a, a disinterested expert? Or does it sound like somebody who forms an opinion before they heard one shred of evidence? That's like me asking you when you were sitting out there. Is it, you, you know the defendant did it, right? You didn't know anything about the case. How could you possibly know? Just because I'm standing there telling you that I charged him with murder? You knew nothing about the case, and yet that's the position this man takes. And you should consider that, because it goes back to his bias, his strongly held opposition to the death penalty. He said this. He said 85% of the time he finds significant adverse developmental factors. Let's talk about it. He says he talks to killers, and the killers he talks to 85% of the time have a significant number of the following. An absent parent. Well, he's got that. But as I indicated to you earlier, he's got a, 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 an involved, caring, loving mother and a supporting network. So it minimizes that. And he had two men in his life. So it minimizes the impact of that. Living in a war zone, as I told you, that doesn't apply. Low intelligence, it doesn't apply. Little or no education, he has an AA. High school degree and an AA. Genetic history of mental illness does not apply. Major history of substance abuse. I only hope my wife wasn't watching yesterday when Miss Noretta said, oh yeah, the guy was an alcoholic, he had three beers a night. I mean, you know, that's not major, you know, that's three beers a night, but there's no indication that there's a major history of substance abuse. And then this, the big one. Okay, here's, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about a young boy who's raised in Detroit, who doesn't have a father, who has a crack addicted mother, who doesn't work, who leaves him at home alone, with no food in the refrigerator, in a neighborhood where people are being shot at random on the streets, where there is chaos and mayhem, mayhem swirling around him, and it damages that person. And as a result of that damage, they do things that they shouldn't do. Because they're damaged, you see? And then the psychological abuse. So on top of those horrible factors you throw in, you're stupid, you're useless, you're worthless, you'll never amount to anything. And you damage them. But that's not him. It's just the opposite of all of that. And so you know what? That means he's not in that 85%. I go to that A score thing, I would suggest to you, remember that was the, um, I can't remember that, what it stood for now, but the scores on that were not accurate from the doctor. 
The defendant, contrary to what the doctor expected to find, also had numerous developmental assets. So not only did he not have these deficits, not only did he not have this horrible upbringing and this terrible life, this abusive, traumatic life, he had positives in his life. He had positives that made him more stable or normal, if you will. Right? Remember that? There was the assets quiz. Now, this guy, this guy, this Dr. Garbarino, scored the assets quiz and said he had what? 16. And 16 put him where? 16 put him below average in assets. But I said, geez, Doc, I think you miscalculated. Do you want to count it again? Right? This professor, he counts him and he's 20. And now he's above average. And now he even has less mitigation. Because he had, as his aunt said, all of the opportunities. The combination of the lack of an adverse developmental factors and the presence of the numerous developmental assets made this defendant's murder quote from Dr. Garbarino very unusual. Where does that put him? In other words, he resides with those 15% of the murderers which are the least mitigated. And remember, it's about the most aggravated and the least mitigated. So, because we don't have that, what are we going to do? Let's throw racism in there and see if that can be a mitigator. So, it's not comfortable for a white man to talk to people about racism. It doesn't have a place here. Because it's not here. It's not here in this case, and you can't find it just because he said it. And I want you to think about this. Because we know, as we've all conceded, there's racism in America. And we know, as we've conceded, there's good and bad in all professions, which includes law enforcement. And we all know, and we heard from some of your fellow jurors of experiences that they've had with their young black men, their boys, how to deal with law enforcement. So we've heard these things. <coughs> oh, sorry, sorry. So we've heard these things through the course of, of, of this trial. But where is it in this case? And I would say to you, if this is a mitigator, if this is happening on a daily basis all across this nation, why are we stepping over the bodies of dead cops at every corner? What makes him different? If he's experienced all these other things, and he has the ability to deal with this. I think that you should consider that to be, well, it's just not there. Your recommendation should not be influenced by feelings of prejudice or racial or ethnic bias. If this is true again, as I've indicated, why aren't they all? Why aren't there dead cops all over the place? And more importantly, if he's had some bad experiences with law enforcement, one of the things the doctor told you is he's got resiliency. And what resiliency means is he's better able and equipped to adapt and overcome adversities in life. That is, he's got the tools to deal with things, whereas you're severely damaged asset-ridden person does not. He does. See, what that means is he has the ability to make decisions, well-reasoned, thought-out decisions, goal-oriented, purposeful decisions, and to deal with stressful situations. The Southern culture of honor and racism. This is not a mitigator. Now, when the doctor talked about the traumatic experiences the defendant had with law enforcement, I want you again, as we look through the prism of his belief system, what did he tell you? He interviewed the defendant for a couple of hours, I forget how long, and the defendant told him about instances of bad encounters with law enforcement. Okay? Bad encounters with law enforcement. Now, what's important about that is it's what the defendant told him. With no independent research, with no questions asked, taking at face value. Now, the source of information, as we talked about in jury selection, garbage in, garbage out, 
The source of information dictates the quality of the opinion. He just takes it at face value. A man who's looking at the death penalty, talking to a guy who's a member of his team that's there to help him. So the first incident, he's talking about running from the cops in a police car because of the presence of weed. I think he was 17 or something, 16 or 17. Um, and and I, b before I leave that, he's engaged in criminal activity. Okay, so it's not like they just picked him out. Picked him out randomly. And he ran in yeah, a car. incident at 16 or 17 years of age with marijuana and running from the cops. But again, he's engaged in criminal behavior. He mentions the killing of a friend by a law enforcement officer in a domestic dispute, and I mentioned to him, look, Doc, isn't that a situation where he indicated the individual who killed, the police officer who killed his friend was an African-American? So it's a cop thing, not a race thing. He's got a problem with cops. And then he talked about being stopped for a DWLS, a driving while license suspended, and had a gun put to his head. Do you remember? That's the way the defendant described it. So he's driving a car, cops pull him over, and put a gun to his head for a, for a misdemeanor suspended license charge. Okay, all right. But no effort to look at any records to confirm whether that's true. No effort to get into any details, like where were you, what was going, just that's it. And that's a, that's a foundation upon which he rests this Southern, honor of Southern culture or whatever and the, and the racism argument on these facts supported, reported by him. And then the one, and again, no additional probing. And then the defendant tells him of the occasion he stopped on his bike, right? This is, he's driving down the neighborhood, no details. Only thing he says is the defendant says to the cop when he asks his name, I'm a, I'm a black man on a bike or something like that. So basically smarting off to the cops. What's so traumatic about that episode or that incident? And did he get into any details with him about that? Or did he talk to, I don't know, what is Dennis, right? There's no indication of violence or threats. It's a counter where the cops talk to him. For what reason, we don't know. But is that something that should be so strongly held in, his, in, in him that it would cause him to commit a murder on the 28th of February 2013 and be mitigating in nature? No details. And then finally, there's the Port St. Lucie incident where he's pulled over again. Cops try to stop him. The defendant says, DWS gun to head. That's the description. But here, I say to the doctor, look, we know what incident this particular one is. The records are there. And what happened is when the cops go to stop him, he doesn't stop. And he drives around a parking lot a few times. And then I say, what about this? Did you review the affidavit? Did you listen to the transcript? Did you watch the video? Because he said something in there that maybe you should consider in light of your opinions in this case. And he says, pussy ass cracker man, fuck y'all. I'll be done. Put that fire on that cracker. And you might have wondered when Miss Maldonado was on the stand why I asked her what fire meant. And this is why. So that when we talked to the doctor, I could say to the doctor, Here's who this guy, here is the details of these instances. Again, he's engaged in criminal behavior. And he's talking about putting fire on that cracker. And I ask him, how, the doctor, how does that comport with your findings? It doesn't, because what it really shows is it's not about racism. It's about he doesn't like cops. It's just that simple. 
It's a cocktail. So I say regardless, even if you think, and again, you know, that, that, here's the problem with this is why Gary pulled him over is lost to the ages because of his voluntary acts. This, that there's, by talking about racism, by talking about profiling, that doesn't mean you should take the leap to that's what happened here. Because that's not what happened here. That's just not what happened. So regardless, even if you assume that somehow these instances impacted him, how does that mitigate his moral culpability? Should this mitigation be available to anyone who's had a negative experience with law enforcement? Anybody who's been pulled over a few times? I wonder what it was like in the 70s when you rode around in one of those mini micro buses and you had long hair. You got pulled over a lot, I'll bet. I'll bet you got pulled over a lot. Bad experience. Does that make it mitigating? And should Sergeant Morales should Sergeant Rouse be held responsible for the misdeeds of a few when all he did was have the grave misfortune of stopping this one? See? Because that's kind of what the mitigation is suggesting. You see, in the end, it's these very experiences in the defendant's life that informed him on the consequences of being stopped by Sergeant Rouse on February 28th. That's to say, he knew that when Gary pulled behind him and turned on his lights, he knows what Mr. he and Mr. Carson talked about. He knew that he's looking at serious prison time. You know that now. You know that now better than you ever knew it. It is so clear and evident that this is at the heart of it. It's not about racism. It's not about Southern culture. It's not about not having a dad. It's about wanting to avoid. It's about wanting to avoid responsibility for your volitional actions. At the end of the day, it's all about choices. He had the ability and the capacity to exercise his free will. And therefore, he should be held accountable for the consequences of those actions. He was not damaged. He was not the victim of this wide, vast, racist conspiracy. He's just a guy who doesn't like cops. And so, for his own selfish, personal gain, he would murder this guy. Look at your, look amongst yourself. Look at one another. Your men, your women, some are young, some are a little more experienced, you're white, you're black, and you're Hispanic. You're America. You are a jury of his peers. And so now, you have been entrusted with the right to make a decision, to make a recommendation to this court, based upon the facts of the law, not based upon fear or prejudice or anger or sympathy, to make a decision for what? They will ask you for mercy. I will ask you for justice. And justice is the concept of moral rightness based on ethics, rationality, the law, fairness, and equity. Hear me now. And I do not mean any insult by this. I do not need all 12 of you to agree on this recommendation. But I'm asking you to. I'm asking you to. I want you to clearly and unequivocally, if you're looking at it and you're thinking the mitigators are outweighing the aggravators, talk to some of your fellow jurors. Ask them why they're thinking otherwise. Because at the end of the day, I want you to send a recommendation to the court that this is about personal responsibility and the loss of human life. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been an honor on behalf of my boss, your state attorney, and the people of this state to appear before you. I thank you. I know what you did to be here, and I'm, I am truly grateful. Thank you.
members of the jury, before we hear from the defense, we'll take just a quick break. If you all need to use the restroom, now is the time. Please don't discuss the case. We'll have you back very shortly. You can leave your notepads there. They'll be there for you when you come back. get your equipment set up and let us know as soon as you're ready. If you'll do it quickly, please. We'll go off the record till they're ready.